thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, now we'll come to the second round table, and uh, well, this 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 round table is about difference or difference, and of course we're talking about the question of culture. And I think just now when uh, Charlene in her paper talks about when we look at intercultural, then are we looking not is it the intercultural that happened within the body or between two bodies? And I think it's not... Then there's one more reality, which is actually then there's another culture that may be happened in that external environment that you are working in and with. And I think that's, that's the other kind of culture that we'll probably also be looking at here. And, and I've been thinking about the word culture also because I also went for the Cultural Leadership Forum and the idea of the culture there seems to be very, very related to a product, where culture as a product. However, I think in this, since yesterday and today, we're really looking at culture as kind of action, how we do things. Uh, I think that that then becomes, again, you know, another study of the dramaturgy of the culture in a sense, uh, where culture then em embodies and encompasses not just the, an object, whether tangible, but it also includes the other intangibles, whether the economics of it and how it operates, uh, whether we're talking about ethnicity, we're talking about uh, the environment, and they're all part of this culture. And somehow, arts become that very, very uh, 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 important language to talk about all this. Uh, and I, that's why today I think it's really, really interesting to actually have to have three people here, and uh, they'll be talking about this idea of how the culture is actually mediated in performances and especially the difference that come with it. Uh, I will do a very quick introduction and I think some of the friends here of course are familiar to from wherever you come from. So I will use this as my intro. Uh, we have uh, Aneth uh, who is uh, a writer, an actor, a broadcaster and producer and she's executive producer of Contemporary Asian Australian Performance, CAAP, the only professional company dedicated to work that gives voice to the contemporary Asian Australian experience. So she has co-directed five theatrical storytelling shows for CAAP with photographer and master st storyteller William Young. Most recently, the backstories for Adelaide Festival. They have also co dramaturg in Between Two, which is now on the Adelaide uh, also Asia Festival, right? This week. this week, okay. So if you can, do catch it. Uh, so Anders will be the first person to speak. Then after that, we have Elfian. I think Singaporeans are quite familiar with, very familiar with Elfian. A resident playwright with uh, Singapore Theatre Company, Wild Rice. He has been nominated 10 times for Best Original Script at uh, Live Theatre Awards in Singapore. And won three of them, Landmarks, Nantira, and... Uh, and Kakakao Punya Lucky. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, ah, 2016 with Hotel, which uh, have just finished uh, its showing here on Saturday. So Elvia has also published uh, as a play poet as well as a writer. And so uh, I think today it will be very interesting to hear his uh, stories as well as his uh, experience. Um, next is Edwin. Edwin uh, is a South Australian theatre maker and a founder and artistic director of Act Now Theatre. Uh, his work focuses on interactive theatre and participatory storytelling, exploring social justice theme. As a community arts practitioner, uh, he works with people with disabilities, prisoners, LGBTIQ communities, young people and refugees and migrants. So if we look at the kind of work that they do, we're really dealing with a lot of uh, differences. And of course, in these differences, what are there actually difference in the way it's actually being presented, you know, as a performative, you know, piece at the end. So I'll now then invite Anna to start. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the tr traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ghana people, and uh, pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, 
Um, so thank you for that introduction. Contemporary Asian Australian Performance. Um, that's the name of our company and that I think immediately signifies to you the kind of stuff that we are trying to grapple with, which is totally about cultural difference. It's at the core of what we do as a theatre company. And for me, um, after listening to David and Charlene, um, my, my whole body is sort of resonating with stuff that I've heard and, and thinking that I've not yet done. But thank you for opening a million doors for me to go, go down. To think about what I have done, um, even before uh, taking on this company, uh, working in the media. Uh, my background is actually in radio and television as a presenter of music programs and then experimental art and film programs um, before I then finally myself became an artist of sorts as a writer and as an actor. Um, so I realised that my entire... A professional career pretty much has been about contributing to the dramaturgy of Australian society. So thank you for that, David. Um, and uh, <laughs> you've given me a sense of, you know, why I do what I do. Um, because I love this idea that we are contributing to a dramaturgy of, of the place in which we live. Um, and using that as the context, let me tell you a little bit about the place in which we live here in Australia, uh, uh, coming from the perspective of a person of Asian background. Um, uh, Contemporary Asian Australian Performance started out as a company called Performance 4A, and it was actually started by two artists, uh, Rick Lau and Paul Cadero, two actors, dancers, choreographers. Um, and they started it up mainly because they and their colleagues couldn't get work. They wanted to create opportunities so that artists of Asian background were not excluded from the work that was being made in Australia. Um, and I joined that company a couple of years after it began just on the board. Um, I didn't actively get involved in the company until uh, Rick, who ended up being its artistic director, went back to Hong Kong partly for personal reasons, but also largely because uh, he couldn't make headway and his own artistic practice was suffering because he couldn't get uh, the kind of work that allowed him to develop as an artist. Um, he, I don't think that he's not worked a day since going back to Hong Kong. Um, so, so this is a sort of industrial issue almost, a thing about um, finding opportunity for people who desire to work in this space and are being kept out simply because of their, the way they look. But I, for me, it has always been about much more than that. Um, for me, it has been about um, presenting work that reflects who we are, the substance of the work, not just the face that presents it. Um, coming also from television and film, you know, there's a, I sort of, for a while there was prob one of the very few Asian faces on television and immediately had to become the face of or the champion of, um, you know, uh, representation, a uh, greater representation on, on screen. And I was uncomfortable with this because for me just having the faces there is not enough. Um, and, and people sort of have tried to deal with that by, by having so-called colourblind casting. Um, but we're still playing the same sort of stereotypical roles and shallow sort of representations um, that have always been there. So for me, it's about bringing authentic stories and deeply thought out stories and character characters um, uh, to uh, a public forum, whether it be a stage or screen or whatever other ways in which art is expressed. Um, uh, so that's the sort of work that I've tried to do in the last four or five years in which I've been leading this company. And we began with storytelling shows, which William Young and I uh, have co-directed together, using people from the community and helping them, facilitating, dramaturging, whatevering them, to tell their own stories. And, um, and this has been um, fantastically successful in many ways in that even people who go to the theatre all the time have found some stories that they've never encountered before, told in voices and perspectives they've not encountered before. Um, and the people themselves are bringing into theatres people who've never been to theatres before because they didn't think there was anything there that related to them. 
And there is that sense of empowerment, of course, when you hear a story that's similar to your own, being told in a public sphere, that's incredibly powerful. So that, that's the sort of context in, in which we work. But we not only make work, we also have a number of programs and initiatives which are about skilling up or providing opportunity for artists of Asian background because we still have felt ourselves closed out from a lot of arenas like major theatre companies, for example, whether as actors or as directors or as writers. And one of the exciting things that we've done, which is pertinent to a dramaturg's network, uh, is that with Playwriting Australia, and Tim Roseman is here from Playwriting Australia, um, we had an initiative about three years ago, we started three years ago a program called Lotus, which was about uh, identifying and nurturing a new generation of writing for the stage. Because there are a lot of people who were not formally training in this area, we found people who had an ability to tell stories and had an ability to write and fast-tracked them. And already this year we have had four productions reach the stage, three of them by main stage companies. So it's been extraordinary in that before that there were barely a handful of plays written by people of Asian background. So, um, so that's the sort of work we do. And Cultural difference to me, always personally speaking, um, difference to me has also always been a virtue. Um, that's how I operate. I, I think difference provides that sort of grit and friction, the roughing up that Sean talked about yesterday, um, that makes life interesting, that creates the conflict and drama, that gives our lives a kind of dynamic. And that's very much what Australia is about. But Unlike Singapore, where I think there's been much more critical thought about this, um, in Australia we're still coming to terms with difference. Um, difference is always talked about in terms of tolerance rather than an embrace or even using it as a virtue, as, as a positive, as something that gives rise to so many possibilities. Certainly in an artistic sense, it gives rise to all these stories that uh, because of racism, basically, have never been told. Um, so, yeah, I see only positives in, in difference. Uh, and that's how we navigate what we do. So, as an example, I'm just going to show you a little clip of In Between Two, which is the show. Um, show here it is. Go, do it. Go ahead. Watch it first. Cultural identity and what it's like to grow up mixed race in Australia. Mungu. Banana, as in yellow on the outside, white on the inside. Or egg, as in white on the outside, but yellow on the inside. Or my personal favourite, slight incline, as in not a full slope. <laughs> we came of age when John Howard came to power, when Pauline Hanson started spewing her anti-Asian rhetoric, and when the Cronulla riots happened. Hip-hop tragics? To me, it was truth music. Unlike pop, it didn't try to generalise, but rather it honed in on the details and it made a pretty solid case for kids who felt like they didn't fit in. Basically, hip-hop spoke to the outsider in me the same way that punk had. So that's just a little taste of the show. So in between two is um, these two hip-hop artists. Uh, Joel Ma is um, Eurasian, his, his father is Chinese, his mother is um, uh, Anglo-Australian, and James Mungo Hick, his uh, mother is a... Uh, comes from a Dutch reformist uh, family here in Adelaide. Uh, his father is a Filipino preacher. Um, and so the two of them are hip-hop artists uh, who have had quite a bit of success in the Australian hip-hop scene but felt always like outsiders uh, because of their background. So this is a show that combines storytelling with beautiful personal um, photographs and um, home movie footage uh, with hip-hop. And uh, it is about the experience of racism, of being outsiders, but it's also about how they have uh, come to reconcile with that and with their family stories. Uh, and it's interesting, this is the third iteration of the show. The first was more or less a gig with a little bit of storytelling in it. The second is one that we premiered last year at Sydney Festival, which was more about the sentiment of family history and the importance of that. But this show is about is the next step where they have really come to understand their own stories 
and why it's important for them to tell it and put it within this context of how they deal with racism and the whole politics of being of mixed heritage. Um, and so that's the way, really, our company has navigated difference and, and, and this show is an example of it. And if you are here Thursday and Friday, or if you're in Melbourne next week, Melbourne Festival, um, you'll have a chance to see the show. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, I will go to the next speaker because I think uh, uh, we need to percolate and think a bit about what she has. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you already have some questions because I also have some questions that I would like to ask Agnes. Uh, let's, let's go to uh, Elfian. And then I think when Elfian's uh, narratives happens and then we actually will have two texts, you know, intertextually we can actually then have small conversation over here. Uh, Elfian. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Heng Luan. Uh, thank you for ev everyone for uh, turning up on a public holiday for this uh, conference. <laughs> okay, um, so I got this title from uh, Hao Nian. And uh, those two words there really uh, intrigued me. I remember sending, sending uh, Hao Nian an email. So I, I, I decided to frame these two words according to certain definitions. Uh, so difference, I understand. Deference was a bit more problematic. I, I was asking Hong Yan, do you mean like <laughs> Deridian difference? Do you mean deferral? Why deference? But anyway, so I... What is that sound? Wow, okay. Press down, <laughs> sorry. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, I looked at difference basically as, as uh, the rise of the individual, non-conformity and radical subjectivity uh, of the artist as well as art making. Uh, but I also looked at deference as a case of uh, majoritarianism, uh, communitarian ideology, Asian question mark forms of social organization, including ju junior, senior, as well as elder and younger dynamics. Um, so looking at deference as that kind of submission or, or respect to authority. Um, majoritarianism is a, is a big issue, I feel, in um, various Asian societies because it, it often uh, bleeds very easily uh, into this kind of uh, the collectivism. Um, also, majoritarianism is a feature of a lot of uh, Asian countries where we practice what is known as illiberal democracy. Uh, so we have, uh, on the surface, free and fair elections. I mean, you have independent election observers who see that, hey, you, you know, you're, you're going through the motions. Yes, it's free and fair. There's, there's no ballot stuffing. Not so many phantom voters. <laughs> but... It's a, it's a kind of hollow democracy, right? And, and if you're not very careful with, with that kind of a, of a purely electoral kind of democracy, um, what happens is that you don't nurture the, the, the spirit of democracy. So it's a kind of democracy, the, the latter of democracy. Uh, and of course, the danger in that is majoritarianism because when people, are, you know, when they vote, they always think, oh, uh, what this means is that we are exercising the will of the majority. But I think when you're talking about the spirit of democracy, you're also talking about the need to protect the most uh, vulnerable minorities in society. And I think that's, that's missing in a lot of these uh, illiberal democracies, which also happen to be authoritarian states. Yeah. And Singapore is an example of an illiberal democracy and also an authoritarian capitalist state which is something quite odd to, to quite a few political theorists because you don't associate capitalism and authoritarianism. You always think democracy and capitalism go together. Uh, but authoritarian capitalism is, is a situation where there's a free uh, circulation of goods and, uh, and uh, services, but no free circulation of ideas. So information is really very tightly controlled. So both Singapore as well as Malaysia would be those kinds of societies. Okay, so I want to talk about, um, in Singapore, I want to talk about Islam today, actually. Um, and I want to talk about this um, space in societies like Singapore as well as Malaysia. So we're talking about majoritarianism. And I would like to talk about the Muslim community, specifically in those countries, and this hostility, actually, to... Um, this minority, seen as minority issues, uh, progressive strains of uh, Islam. So I, I know we are aware of um, 
uh, conservatism in Islam and you know uh, people talk about Wahhabism for example people talk about the Iranian revolution in 1979 as uh, as a kind of export of uh, Islamic revolutionary ideas um, but I think uh, there's less focus on how these ideas are actually distributed uh, and circulated in society so I think this uh, idea that you have Saudi Arabia and you have Iran and they're in some kind of Sunni Shiite rivalry. That's only part of the picture. Of course, petrodollars uh, are responsible for the export of certain puritanical forms of Islam. But also, I think within the communities, certain ideas spread as well. And a lot of that has to do with, unfortunately, anti-colonial sentiment. So in many ways, your rejection of, let's say, liberal Islam is also a rejection of, of what they believe is uh, Western liberalism or things that are emanating from the West that they feel are threatening the, the core of Islam. So this is a book, uh, it's, it's more of a screed actually, against uh, uh, liberal Islam. Uh, it's, it's published in Malaysia by the, down there you'll see this thing called the Persatuan Ulama Malaysia, the uh, religious uh, authority organization of Malaysia. And it says, uh, liberal, liberal, liberal Islam issues and challenges. This is uh, basically in diagram form what they think of liberal Islam. <laughs> so you have a brain there and it's uh, replaced by a donut. Uh, not too sure why. I, I, don't, I, yeah, I don't get many clues there. So semioticians in the audience would love to unpack this. Um, mash, uh, yeah, I suppose mash and... No nutritional value, exactly, maybe junk food, right? So um, the idea of liberal Islam is associated with materialism, no uh, nutritional value, I suppose, associated with spiritual values. Okay, so this is in Malay, but is it, I found this very interesting. Uh, so this thing circulate, not necessarily at an elite level, but, you know, popularly as well. A lot of warnings against our liberal Islam. So I'll translate that first bit. Uh, liberal Islam is a kind of deviant understanding that has its origins in uh, this attitude of uh, low confidence, of uh, inferiority complex, and it valorizes the th thinking of, of the West uh, by a small group of Muslims. So we can see that kind of anti-colonial hostility uh, being expressed in antagonism towards uh, liberal Islam. Um, here they are looking at the features of um, uh, liberal Islam. They say the foundational features are freedom of thought. Scary, right? Freedom of thought is seen as something dangerous. Uh, pluralism, pluralism up there, uh, that's defined as um, uh, uh, this idea, the ecumenical idea that all religions you know, share certain features. Um, it, another feature they, they claim is uh, criticism of the of the Quran, criticism of the Hadiths, which is another source for Islamic jurisprudence, the um, rejection of Islamic law, uh, as well as emancipation of women. <laughs> These are considered dangerous things. Uh, other features, um, homosexuality is um, allowed. Um, there is an admixture with... Uh, Western philosophies, the um, the championing of uh, human rights, and influence uh, orientalist influences. So that's uh, the the bit on the right. So it goes into the conspiratorial very fast. So you can see uh, sponsored by the United States. Uh, uh, university foundations. It talks about the pluralism project in in Harvard University. And then it's also, uh, on this box, it talks about sponsorship by both Christians as well as Jewish foundations. And if they've identified a identified few there, including Asia Foundation. I don't know which one. Asia, number one. Asia, number <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. I don't know what this is. I know Japan Foundation has got, has got Asia Center. I don't know what this is. Anyway, um, yeah, all these acronyms, uh, including CIA, of course, uh, Favorite Whipping Boy. Um, uh, and all this acronym. So this is something that is emerging from, from Indonesia. So within what we call the Nusantara, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, we have these kinds of discourses. Next. Um, this is from a Malaysian newspaper. It says secularism has never had a place 
in Malaysia. Uh, this is a lie, the <laughs> um, the ball face lie. But then uh, it appears in the Malaysian media, you know. So it it has a, a level of respectability, yeah. Um, and and it is a, a very right wing conservative media actually, especially the Malay newspapers in 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 Malaysia. So so these things circulate, uh, and in Singapore as well, which is which otherwise recognizes that it is a secular state. We have, for example, this person who's an associate professor in the, the Malay Studies Department. And then, um, that's his name, Syed Mohamed Karudin. So, question, dear Prof, could you share about what we should do with this new development called Liberal Islam, which is now supporting the lesbian movement? So, I don't know why specifically lesbian and why not gay or, or LGBTs, etc. But yeah, you know, even in Singapore, at sort of like the elite uh, academic levels that people you would assume might be a bit more sympathetic to liberal causes, these ideas have penetrated. Yeah. But like what I said, it's really tied in with, with anti-colonial uh, ideas. And this makes it very difficult to critique Islam within Islam without being seen as a Western stooge. So uh, there's glimmers of hope, actually. It's not all doom and gloom. This is uh, an NGO in, in Malaysia, which is called Sisters in Islam, a feminist uh, Islamic group. Yeah. So there's the lawyer, Ratna Othman, the, the one with the turban. Marina Mahate, who is the daughter of an ex-Prime Minister of Malaysia. And uh, Zaina Anwar there, Sisters in Islam, one of the more progressive uh, bodies in Malaysia. Um, there they are. We're all Allah's children. We'll answer to Allah. So it's interesting. Uh, the organization is spearheaded mainly by women. And they look at reform, Islamic reform, within areas like family law. Um, this is uh, Imran Taib, uh, Singaporean, also heads this uh, NGO, a liberal Muslim NGO, which is called the Reading Group. Okay, so I, I want to talk about, given this kind of a background, what are some of the challenges that are faced by people who do Malay theatre in Singapore, people who try to um, push for certain progressive ideas uh, in Singapore. So this is one of the playwrights in Singapore. She's holding a book, an anthology of her published Malay plays. She's been in a lot of controversies and I really <laughs> respect her for that. Um, all the way back since, um, I think, in, in the year 1990, so she did a play called Kosovo, which uh, looked at the Bosnian crisis um, as it was unfolding. And uh, in her play, there were uh, these characters who were nuns. And she had Malay uh, actors acting as nuns. So no problem, right? It's acting. You're putting on a, a, another character and the character's habits. And, and that's okay. But she, um, they also made the gesture, the sign of the cross on their bodies. And this was a huge... Uh, controversy. Uh, the idea that to perform these gestures is in a sense to to exit Islam <laughs> and to take on another religion. Um, and, and this has always been a big debate within Islam. Uh, mimesis uh, and representation. Um, so a lot of Islamic art, for example, you see there's, there's an iconism, which means that you know, it's non-representational. There, there are big issues with representing the human figure, with rep representing, for example, even the prophet uh, in Islam. So you see a lot of Islamic art is either calligraphy, geometric geometric patterns, uh, plants, foliage, but not representational figures. So how acting is located within Islamic art has always been very contentious, yeah. And they don't, some people don't necessarily, more, more conservative factions among Muslims don't necessarily see uh, a separation between the actor and the character. So if you do certain things on stage, you sin as that, uh, because it is your body. There is no way in which you can dislocate yourself, even if you're playing another. So that was a big controversy. Uh, another controversy happened uh, in 97. She did a play called Ikan Chante. It's a feminist Muslim play. And she had her six actors, all women. So it's a girl power kind of a, a, a play to shave their heads bald. And in the publicity, they were bald. And then, again, there was a big controversy because apparently, according to some of the hadiths or the traditions, uh, women who are bald are harbingers of the apocalypse, of, of doomsday, you know. And of course, Shini Akona has been around for the longest time. The world has not ended yet. <laughs> so I don't know why they were specifically picking on these six women. So that's, that's Alin Mosbit. Um, 
the next is this uh <laughs> I know he looks so serious there, but just Nora Fendi Ibrahim. Uh, also another Malay Muslim uh, theatre maker in Singapore. Uh, in the year 1990, he did this very interesting play called Anak Melayu. So these are the people who have been pushing uh, from the start. And uh, Anak Melayu means Malay child, and it looked at delinquency within the Malay Muslim community. And I think one of those first few plays where we look where... Uh, the language that was used, for example, broke from the usual convention of having, of, of having literary Malay. So it was really vernacular, street Malay. There were lots of swear words used. For his efforts, um, the Criminal Investigation Department, <laughs> the CID in Singapore, was dispatched to, to interview him for the use of a few very coarse uh, uh, Malay words in this particular play. And that's, of course, because licensing was uh, handled by the police at that point of time. So they received complaints from the public, you know. Um, and I think the Malay Muslim community, because it is a minority community, there's, there are all these questions about self-image. There are questions about performing under a majority gaze. Uh, so that space for, for diverse representations is always very limited. You always want to, in a sense, project your best selves because it is a minority community that's often pathologized in Singapore. So you are a problem community. Uh, you are the most economically depressed community in Singapore. Right? And that's a fact. So you have the, the Indian and the Chinese communities, the Malay community is the one that is seen as an underclass. And also there are these uh, uh, social problems as well. So the, the high prison population, there's a drug problem. Of course, with Islam, there's also the, the, the affiliation with terrorism. Yeah, so this is Fanny Ibrahim. Uh, so from that experience, which was a, so a play that was done in the mode of social realism, he's moved on into a bit more abstract works. And I think those are ways for him to try to evade some of these controversies. Yeah. So he's got a play called Ahmad, for example, where there are six men and they're all called Ahmad. Uh, so when they when they say Ahmad, you don't know who the hell they're referring to, but apparently all of them. Uh, it talk in a way it talks about the homogeneity of the Malay community, their need to conform, and in the whole play, uh, as they're having dialogues and conversations, they're just feeding bananas uh, to one another. Yeah, so there's a whole sort of a uh, what do you call that banana, no bigger than a bunch <laughs> that you carry on your shoulders and like. It's a tanggang, right? But I don't know what's the English collective noun for it. But anyway, that's a huge banana. And they were just f feeding each other like maybe 10 bananas throughout the whole whole play for each of them. So this is Norfan Ibrahim. Um, so I wanted to also talk about this particular play, um, which became a, a flashpoint in Singapore. Uh, this play was done in the year 2000. And I think the term crisis of representation best describes it. Um, talak is um, a term used in uh, Sharia family law. If you want to divorce your, your wife, uh, the rights to divorce rest almost purely in the husband. So if you want to divorce your wife, you say talak one time. So if you say talak once, um, you can remarry. If you say it twice, so you, it's three strikes and you're out. <laughs> if you say three talaks, that means you can never remarry uh, that, that wife. So it's a kind of a Islamic divorce law, etc. So um, a playwright in Singapore, Indian, but also a Hindu, wrote this play based on his uh, research with this particular actress. Her name is Nagis Banu. She's an Indian Muslim. Um, and the play was performed in Tamil. So he interviewed her and she talked about the domestic abuse that she suffered uh, at the end of her husband. She also talked about how her husband was trying to use certain uh, Islamic verses, etc. to justify this abuse. You know, and, and some of it would include um, a hadith which says um, if you are riding on a camel with your husband and your husband wants sex at that very moment, you have to give it to him on the camel. Uh, I don't know how that's done. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what position is there. I mean, I, there's a hump, right? So I, 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 I don't know how they do it. But, you know, this, is, this has been used um, to, to, to justify marital rape, for example. Uh, that, 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 that once you're in a marriage situation, the woman has no autonomy to say no uh, to the husband's demands for sex. So, Ilan Gavan did this, and it was done first in Tamil, actually, 
to, to little fanfare. It was well-reviewed, etc. What happened later was that in the year 2000, they wanted to translate this work into both Malay as well as English, and that's when all hell broke loose. So, again, as I mentioned just now, the idea of performing for the majority gays, the idea of, in a sense, airing your, your dirty linen uh, to a wider public. Uh, and what happened was that the license was not granted for this subsequent performance, and it was the National Arts Council, actually, that, that came in and tried to stop the performance from happening, even to the extent of telling the theatre company that had booked a theatre, oh, you, you can't go into the theatre. If you do so, it's considered trespassing. There was a huge confrontation with, with the police. Um, so what, what happened, I mean, it's a whole series of mishaps, I feel, because uh, what happened was that, so yesterday what Rachel said about consulting elders is very interesting. So another issue about crisis of representation, they brought in so-called advisors or consultants from the Indian Muslim community without knowing that this particular organization was one of the more conservative uh, organizations within the Indian Muslim community. And despite this being a, a play about, you know, a woman and about family and marital violence, uh, there were no Muslim women whom they consulted at all. So it became really a case of elders within the Muslim community exerting or, or trying to police, you know, in a very patriarchal way, what the women folk from the community could say. Uh, so in a sense, the National Arts Council became complicit in this kind of a censorship yeah, of the more progressive uh, voices within the community and also women's voices. They were complicit in the oppression of uh, women uh, within the Indian Muslim community. So even before intersectionality became you know, uh, something that was invoked, so you, you could see how gender as well as uh, race and religion intersected in this case. Yeah. So this, this gives you sort of a backdrop survey of what we are dealing with in Singapore. So I just want to uh, discuss a play that we did in Singapore um, in our attempt to carve out a space for progressive or, or liberal uh, ideas in, in, in Islam. And uh, this place called Nadira, we did it in 2009. Um, this is uh, the publicity image for the play. You see a woman in the middle. She's flanked by two other pe people. One is a uh, Muslim, her daughter, and she's uh, holding up her hands in prayer. The other man is saying grace. So this play actually was uh, um, inspired by a filmmaker from Malaysia who's called Yasmin Ahmad. And she passed away very suddenly in the year 2009. And in my grief, I thought, okay, you know, I really needed to, to respond to this in some way. So I thought I would look at her back catalogue of films and try to uh, write um, a play based on each of her films, you know, as a kind of giving them a, an afterlife. Uh, and she's also an interesting figure in Malaysia. I think she's also one of those who have been trying to carve out a space for both multiculturalism, uh, a response to ethno-nationalism in, in, in Malaysia, uh, and also liberal Islam. So this is a film. It's called Mu'alaf. Mu'alaf in Arabic means the convert. So this is my riff on that film, which is uh, Nadira. <laughs> so even the, uh, yeah, the publicity um, quoted that image. So the play begins uh, with the mother and daughter praying on stage. Um, so already it, it gave the audience uh, the sense that, okay, you know, this is a play that's going to be about mis Islam. Um, so the, the dramaturgical choices that we're making, what, what kind of a play could we do to reach certain sectors of the Singaporean audience? It was very deliberate to go, to choose social realism, you know? And I know some people will say, oh, but that's such a conservative form. Why are you trying to communicate to conservative audiences um, with a conservative form? You know, why not challenge them? Why don't use more uh, formally experimental? But I we really did feel with our understanding of the demographics of this audience that this was something that they were familiar with, this was something that would not alienate them from the start, that they still responded very strongly to narrative, for example. Yeah. So um, this is an image from the play. So I'll talk, talk you through some of the characters that we have in the play. And I, and 
I don't want to over-explain, but maybe you can see how they would represent certain... Uh, there's a whole constellation of, of issues uh, in the Muslim community. So who's Nandira, the, the main character? She is uh, the vice president of the university's Muslim society, and she plans all these interfaith meetings with the representatives of other faith organizations. So in the play, when the play starts, the upcoming meeting that she organizes uh, encounters problems because the topic of on-campus evangelism is deemed too sensitive by some, especially the Christian organizations. So this is Nadira. So um, it was uh, important for us to go from the public where she wears a hijab and then to the private to the domestic fear, sphere where she takes it off. And this was important for us because, again, the idea of mimesis and, and acting uh, in Islam, right? And, and that if she doesn't wear the hijab, it means she's a, she's a bad Muslim. But we wanted to show that within a domestic setting, it's just her and her mother. This is, this is realistic, yeah. Okay, so this is her again without her hijab. So there are issues also about performing um, Islam, performing Muslimness in a private as well as public context. So let's look at her mother, which I think is the crux of the story. Oh, I think I missed out a slide, sorry. Okay, so the mother there um, wearing the hijab, she's a, a convert to Islam. So she's actually a Chinese woman. She uh, married a Malay Muslim man and then she converted to Islam. And then um, the Malay Muslim man happens to be uh, a Malaysian. So she went over to Malaysia, she lived a Muslim life, and then she had Nadira, uh, gave birth to Nadira, her first child, and only child. Um, the thing was that later on, the Malay Muslim man, so it's not this man, this man is, is later someone else who she falls in love with. The Malay Muslim man decides to have a second wife, uh, which is allowed within Islam. So that becomes a, a kind of critique of polygamy within Islam. So he wants to have a second wife. She says no. She wants to have a divorce. And under Sharia law, automatically, because Nadira, her daughter, is less below eight years old, she gets automatic cust cust custody. So she brings Nadira back to Singapore. And she raises Nadira um, as a very staunch Muslim, sends the girls to madrasas, etc., because she's afraid of losing her daughter. She's afraid of losing custody because when she first gained custody, the judge was basically saying, you are a new convert. I don't think you can raise your child in the Muslim manner. So we have a situation where the mother is not so Muslim, but the daughter is very Muslim. Yeah. And then she meets uh, this man called Robert Goh. He's a general practitioner. He's a Christian and he does not wish to convert to, to Islam. So this becomes the inciting incident in the play. Uh, it's an interfaith relationship that we're looking at. And we find Nadira actually struggling um, to reconcile this idea of the interfaith in public. And then in private, she has to deal with her mother's interfaith uh, relationship. Then there are other characters as well. This is Farooq Haji Osman, who is the president of the Muslim Society, and he wishes to mediate, persuade Robert to either convert or Sahira, who is Nadira's mother, to abstain from civil marriage. And then lastly, we have this other character, uh, Nadira's best friend. So she's the one in red there. Masna Kamsani. Uh, she's a liberal feminist Muslim. Uh, she researches Sufi literature as a way of getting romantically close to a Turkish exchange student. And then at the end of the play, she actually wears the hijab. Yeah. So the different characters, I think, representing um, different aspects of the debate. And I just want to focus on this uh, character of Nadira, uh, of Sahira, and how in our, in our dramaturgical thinking, uh, when we thought we wanted to do a play of religious freedom, but we always knew from the start that to do a play about, let's say, a Malay Muslim person who denounces the religion or wants to convert is really going to be a very sensitive flashpoint. Uh, we would be seen as advocating for, for something that, that was, was very unacceptable to the wider, larger Muslim community. So we had to be very strategic. We had to really dramaturg this play. Um, you know, and that's why I, I really like today's topic, social and cultural dramaturgy. What dramaturg it for this particular audience and their particular cultural sensitivities, yeah. Um, 
we knew it was going to be very taboo. We knew that apostasy was, was one of those taboos in Islam, and, yeah, as was blasphemy, etc. So uh, the figure of Sahira became a kind of liminal figure because she wasn't Muslim and then became Islam. So in a sense, you had one foot in and one foot out of the religion already. And that became a bit more palatable for our audience. Of course, we have also been criticized for not pushing the envelope hard enough, that it, this was a kind of cop-out compromise. But we felt that this was really the only way for us to initiate some kind of dialogue rather than for having people sort of like become defensive from the start. And also within the play, to have someone who's a so-called liberal feminist Muslim to suddenly have this uh, change of heart and put on the hijab was also another way for us to... Um, not appear so strident and monodimensional uh, in, in trying to advocate for a kind of liberal Islam. It was very important. And I think um, we mentioned this yesterday, uh, Heng Luan, when you said that uh, you found the monologue form very political because it's basically one person on stage who's talking and that's it's just one person. You know, in a sense, it could be an imposition of a very singular viewpoint. And I think the, the issue with Talak was that you had that. You had this one woman individual with unfettered space to tell her side of the story. And of course, she, she, she deserves that space. But I think important also in a play like Nadira to sort of show the other viewpoints and give the audience a sense that their viewpoints were also given that space on stage. Yeah, I think I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you. I think a lot to unpack afterwards also uh, in terms of the representation within a body and of course uh, the, the dramaturgical choice and tools, linguistic choices, uh, character choices, even the form itself, whether it's a monologue or it's actually a play with a few, hand, uh, a few handers play, actually inform how we actually want to bring the message out through the piece. And I think that is something that uh, when you are, you know, dealing with this kind of uh, space whereby at the same time there are certain taboos that you need to challenge, you know, you have to, you have to ask yourself, how far do you want to go? And so the question is, is there a self-censorship? Which does it mean then? Because if there's a self-censorship that you are being not honest to the work, to the community that you're working with, I think those are things that actually dramaturgs as well as the maker have to negotiate you know, in the process. Let's go to Edwin and, and hear his uh, 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 sharing. Thank you, Edwin. Um, it's on? This is on? Yes, great. Um, thanks. So, yeah, my name is Edwin. I'm the artistic director of a company called Act Now Theatre, which is based in Adelaide. Um, I'm going to talk about the company. Um, I'm going to talk about three of the guiding principles that we use when we create work, um, and I'll talk about two projects that we've created. Um, one is called Responding to Racism, which is a forum theatre show about racism, and the other was a um, another interactive project using mobile phones to explore virtual intimacy by queer artists. Um, so. Um, I think I'm going to start. For, I think it's good to start by saying that I think art is not real in in the most kind of obvious way that um, in the same way that the the Mona Lisa is not a woman smiling, it's a painting of a woman smiling. A performance is not a performance about domestic violence is not domestic violence, um, and in the same way, our projects don't solve problems. Our projects can signal the solution to problems or can generate the solution to problems that hopefully get used in the real world, but our, our work or art in general is not real. Um, and I think that the unrealness of it is what's useful about art, that, um, that art takes something from the real world and places it into an unreal space, and then in that unreal space you can look at it from different angles and... Um, and talk about it and see it for what it is so that when you go back to the real world, you can see it differently to what it was before. Um, so, uh, I might just go to the next slide, which 
is our first guiding principle, which is imagination. So it's for us, creating a better world starts with imagination. We use art as the bridge between what is and what could be. Our work creates spaces for audience, participants and artists to imagine a better world and build it. Um, so, yeah, that's very much about um, uh, trying to create an unreal space so that people can have the conversations about something that is real and then go out and kind of apply it to the real world. Um, a lot of the way that we do that is through um, a style of theatre called Forum Theatre, um, which is uh, basically where you show a, a short play that has a number of problems in it, but no solution, no resolution, and you show it twice to an audience the first time. You present the problems and you say, we don't know how to solve it, and then you go back to the start of the play and you present it a second time, and the second time the audience members can come up on stage and replace characters to try to deal with the, the situation. Um, so it's very much about us not telling an audience this is what you should do to deal with the particular problem, but it's um, us saying, actually saying we want to learn from you and we want to um, hear your ideas on how you can solve this particular problem in the community that you're in. Um, it's in it was interesting um, hearing some of the artists from Singapore talking about the way that Forum Theatre was banned in the, in the 90s and is kind of starting to become more popular now. Um, because I think it's, um, it's, it seems like there was a kind of flip in Australia where it was really popular in the 90s in the kind of theatre and education movements and then it, it kind of it trailed off and became no, no long, was no longer seen as being contemporary or was um, kind of poo-pooed as being this um, uh, community arts practice which I think often community arts now has become a lot more um, bourgeois and gentrified and forum theatre has kind of been left beside, which I think is really interesting because I think I think there's um, I think there's a good case for the resurgence of forum theatre in Australia um, and all over the world because of the way that the world is changing for um, uh, industries like education or politics or media, um, all these things of Wikipedia or Uber or um, social media, all that kind of stuff is all about the the power structure changing from a, a, a hierarchy to a network um, and that's globally what's going on. That's the, the biggest changes that are going on globally is that change in power structure and I think the really interesting question is how can art, what, what is the journey that art will go on to incorporate that power structure of a network. Um, so I might go to our next guiding principle, which is participation. Um, and that is that empowerment starts by taking part. We believe that in theatre, as in democracy, representation isn't enough. We need direct participation in political processes and universal access to arts as part of daily life. We break down barriers to participation by creating work in schools, workplaces and in public, public spaces. Our work is participatory democracy in a theatrical form and we want to help it make education more engaging, activism invigorating and citizenship empowering. Um, and to me the, the thing there is um, representation isn't enough. Um, the rep representation is really flawed um, in political processes as well as in... Um, as in art or on stage, that um, it's not... I mean, if, yes, we do need much, much better representation and represent, representation is important, but also we need direct participation and for people to be able to actively get involved. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, this project that we did in January this year called Zero Feet Away, which um, was a... We described it as a... Um, an experiment in virtual intimacy. It was uh, a project that, um, it was originally commissioned by Gay Men's Health to look at safe sex. Um, and they had seen a show that we did around homophobia. And they they thought, oh yeah, this is great. We want to do a forum theater show on safe sex. Um, I was like, oh, like, how do, I, don't, I don't want to talk to an audience, a bunch of strangers about their sex lives and 
it was like it, it was like you know stop put a condom on it, like it, it seems very strange um so we we did a couple of developments and designed a, a mobile phone app that enabled the audience to have anonymous communication with us on stage about their sex lives. Um, and the structure of the performance was basically the the artists in the space um, sharing their own stories about being on Grindr or um, having sex or what it means to be gay or queer in Adelaide in 2017. Um, and then we would ask questions to the audience through this app where we would say, um, what's the best sex you've ever had or what's the worst sex you've ever had or um, what's something you would never tell a stranger or you know whatever the kind of the questions were. Um, and I think that project as well as the forum theatre stuff that we do and all the things that we do um, really looks at difference through focusing on diversity and similarities. Um, so we um, uh, asking question, even just simple questions to the audience of, um, you know, what's your sexuality? You get this this feed of responses that shows the diversity and the similarities between the people um, in the space. So um, I'll go to the last guiding principle, which is openness, um, that we're open to learn, open to share, open to collaborate, open to conversations, open to uncertainty. We don't know the future or hold the answers. We see our work as building the conversations that matter to people, not ending them. Um, which kind of brings me to this other project, which is um, called Responding to Racism, um, which was originally commissioned by Reconciliation SA, which is a, um, a state-based organisation that um, focuses on um, Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people working, walking and uh, learning together. Um, they wanted to create a forum theatre show about racism um, and the kind, of, um, the kind of the caveat of the commission was that we also had to co-deliver a full day event that they ran um, uh, that was um, structured around conversations about racism. Um, and so that project um, was really interesting in terms of... Um, it's a forum theatre show, it's an, like a 90 minute um, bit that we do in the middle of the day, but then the three hours before and the two hours after afterwards are how we can structure conversations with the audience or play games or do exercises that are about, um, again, it's about um, diversity and similarities. Um, so we'll, um, uh, in terms of the kind of the nitty gritty stuff, we we, um, we start by playing a game, Have You Ever, um, which is a kind of modified drinking game where um, people um, all move around if they've done the activity that somebody has called out. Um, and then we get people to break off into small groups and they find three things that they have, have in common with this stranger. So they might say, oh, we both got blue socks on or we both go for the same football team or whatever it is. Um, and we kind of, we structure the day so that there's these, um, it's kind of um, like the concentric circle type stuff that was talked about yesterday, where we, but it's, we go from the personal to the interpersonal to the social to the group discussion and then back down so that the conversation's kind of starting small, getting bigger and bigger and then going smaller and smaller again. Um, yeah, so that's, um, I think that's all that I kind of want to talk about. Um, and then I'm happy to go on to the Q&A part of it. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Edwin raised the issue whether art is not real. Then we yesterday actually we talked about the authenticity and roughness. And of course then there is the idea that whether art is just representational. So if it's representational, what's the politics behind it? And the purpose of the representation and then, of course, what is the critical distance that after when art is being presented, you know, how does one mediate and what is being represented and what is being perceived? I think those, those are very important uh, things that actually he has actually raised. Mm. I've actually asked the three uh, uh, speakers here to do this, that they actually ask each other questions uh, because in, in a way their work resonates. Uh, I think uh, it would be good to actually hear them asking questions of each other 
after they hurt each other, and then from there we extend our conversations, you know, to 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 the, you know, to the audience, and then let's hope that you know, we'll have more interactions in this process. Any questions from yes? Um, I'll I'll attempt to do that. Is uh, yes, the the idea of art is not real is something that um, really jumped out at me because it is contrary. Um, as you've rightly put it, um, uh, to some of the, the ideas that were talked about yesterday and also the phrase that's come up quite a lot about talking about how art is intrinsic to everyday life and if it is not a real thing, how can it be intrinsic? And I guess it does come down to some degree to definition. What you What is an artwork? Is it the picture on the wall of the pipe? Is it the play we've just seen on a stage? Or does art involve everything, all the thinking and the life experiences and the episodes that have led to the creation of that object or that moment in time and the, uh, the implications that come after the performance or exhibition of that artwork? Is that all part of the art? And to me it is. Um, art is all of that. And for me, therefore, art is real. So we've heard Alfian talk about the making of this work, Nadira, and about all the risks that are taken, real risks, that are taken in, in presenting this work to an audience and all the compromises, artistic decisions, dramaturgical decisions that are made to keep people safe from the law, to keep the work from being closed down, to keep from... Uh, igniting a massive public uh, response or outrage to the work, that is very real. Uh, so to me, to say art is not real doesn't hold water. Yes. And, and, yeah, and, if, yeah. and, and I don't know how you can have that uh, parameter, art is not, how you can start from that point, art is not real and make anything that can have any meaning. Yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, I think you're totally right that the um, the the relationship between art and the context in which it's presented is real, and that um, uh, and especially in community arts, but also in in other contexts, um, there there's real implications, and there's real people, and there's real meaning, and all that kind of stuff. But that. Um, it's like I think also play is not real, um, and that when you have in within play, you can kind of you can kind of bully people in play. But when when it stops being play and starts being bully, it's bullying. Then it's not play, and the play is the unrealness of something, even if it's a, a, a play about or playing about bullying. Um, so I think yes, I think you're right, but that the, the um, uh, I think it's important that uh, art is. I, I think definitionally art is not real and it's, it is a representation of something. But th those examples are really interesting examples where it, it's totally blurred. Um, and also in forum theatre it's totally blurred when you, you get someone that comes up that um, is kind of representing someone standing up for something or expressing a view that they have. And on, on one hand it's, it's a representation but also uh, the magic of that kind of stuff is that there is a realness of it that this person has actually got this thing that's going on that they've come up and that the act of performing it is also doing it. Um, but I still think you're, you're doing it in a in a, um, a non-real space, which is the stage. Uh, I just like it if people disagree on a forum. Actually, I can't. <laughs> It makes things more interesting. I feel like an umpire sitting in the middle. And just <laughs> We're different. Both good points. Great points, yeah. So, I mean, I, I agree with both, I suppose. Um, but I, I think, we, yeah, the, the idea of the real also brings me back into perennial debate about representation uh, within Islam and... Um, you know that I, I I'm not sure how far we're gonna push it within Singapore. Uh, the idea that the character is not the actor, uh, the idea that if you are showing a bit of flesh on stage, it's not really your body; it's the character's body. So, uh, these are things that I feel are being constantly negotiated. Yeah. So so I think the issues of representation is a huge huge one uh, when it comes to to Islam and art and performance. I mean, just just a uh, an observation that I had. Uh I think along this line here was that I was at the uh, South Australia 
gallery uh, on Saturday and was going through the uh, all the paintings, the portraits, especially when it goes all the way to the contemporary art. Uh, especially in the portrait part, actually, you will see the the uh, portraits of usually the whites, the the and they're usually big portraits. And uh, but when there are uh, portraits of uh, uh, drawings of the uh, First Nations that is usually smaller. However, as as you look at the entire gallery, when it comes to the contemporary time, uh, because of a lot of the First Nation artists starts to express themselves, you find that the work that they created are actually symbolic, which is very much in the uh, culture of actually how the First Nation represent themselves. Uh, then from that moment, you actually don't see the faces of the uh, First Nations in 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 the gallery in the art history, and that 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 is actually a very interesting uh, uh, observation because then, in a way, in if you look at the art history then of visual art history, the faces of 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 the First Nation don't appear in those representation, and so where are they, and how they how do people get, you know the. the Again, we go back to the visible and the invisible, the representation and the symbolic, and how do we actually negotiate what we see every day with what is being represented through art. And I think your question of whether art is real or not, or, and your, your, your thought about art actually go beyond that object that you see, and how is it, if it's beyond this object, how is it mediated with the reality that we have? And a lot of time, I think the power of art is actually that, is that it's not just about that object, it is about its impact, you know, that, that, that spreads across. And how do we actually, again, look at our art and see, and how do we evaluate, especially for dramaturg, what makes a work uh, meaningful and real, or even authentic, or even uh, 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 of value? Mm -hmm. Yes, Sean. So just to um, develop that point and to, I guess, to use the language of roughness to introduce some granularity about thinking of, of uh, this, notion, this discussion about representation. I mean, I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm thinking a lot about um, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, right? Where his proposition is, you know, what's the Society of the Spectacle? It's not that everything is a spectacle, but the fact that um, our relations are mediated through the spectacle, right? And so taking that proposition, right? And, and, and insofar as we have this, you know, um, provisional separation of the real and representation or the real and my mises, I guess I, my provocation or, or my, my kind of curiosity is then how is representation also a kind of performative, right? So what is this representation doing? How does, how does representation mediate reality, right? Um, rather than just something that floats above Reality. So I, I mean, it's precisely I think what you're also trying to get at about this, the mediation of the representation and the object. And I think I, I'm curious about the, the kind of specific strategies that um, each of you, because I guess each of you have mentioned or, or, or talked about this notion of representation as well. So I'm quite curious about how um, each of you might have employed representation in a performative um, way, right? Trying to intervene into a particular kind of uh, situation. Um, for, uh, uh, so with some of the, the stuff that we do that's more forum focused, we'll often say um, if you can identify with the struggle that this person is going through, then you can come up and you can represent that person or you can, you can be that person on the stage and, um, and try out some kind of solution. Um, so uh, that to to put that ask on someone to um, uh, to only do that if they can identify with the struggle um, is a useful way to um, uh, to avoid people representing something that they they don't have the kind of the authority or the place to represent. Um, yeah, uh, but more broadly, I'm 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 kind of not sure. Like I think um, uh, with a lot of our stuff it's um it is uh it's just about designing a space for people to be able to 
to represent themselves and then we just learn from that um from them doing what they're doing we just learn from that and it's just creating the space for them to do that and then we have the conversation um in the context of um asian australian performance and um um as i think i might have mentioned the 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 many of the roles that our actors uh have the opportunity to perform are largely stereotypical or very shallow. Like when I was um, working as an actor, I remember I, I got an award for a role I played and for the first time I got an agent and um, four opportunities to audition came my way fairly quickly, which really surprised me, um, given there's so few roles for people of Asian background. And they were all very different kinds of productions but in every single one of these four productions, the role was to play a waitress in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and, uh, and in fact, the Australia Council did a, um, a, um, a report about this issue way back, like in the year 2000, I think it was published, and it was, cool. uh, it was about representation, it was about the kind of roles that people of non-Anglo background had, you know, and so not just Asian people, but maybe Greek people and Italian background people and Middle East and whatever. And it was called um, um, The Cook, The Green Gross, The Green Gross of the Cook and the Taxi Driver. That was the name of the report. So those were the sort of roles that mostly men of non-Anglo background would be offered. And these days, the many young actors in um, our database, we have a database of about 200 uh, actors of Asian background, and whenever you talk to the beautiful, um, um, talented young women in particular um, on that database, 80% um, of them will tell you that the only roles they get are to play sex workers. Um, and I, I thank my lucky stars that I'm not acting anymore because one, I'm too old to be cast as a sex worker and two, I've never been the sort of sexy body image sex worker kind of thing. But um, there was a period about two years ago when I, I got offered some roles to play the embittered brothel keeper, ex-sex worker, <laughs> still trying to keep it up. <laughs> so... This is really disillusioning for an artist, but also what does it say about our society or the artists in our society who can only imagine us as sex workers? So that's an example of the sort of stuff that we're trying to deal with. Uh, and so for me to try and subvert the act of representation, we're, we're not up to that yet. We're trying to give a true and full and meaningful representation of the characters that we have in our works. Um, that, you know, being able to pervert it and subvert it, well, that, that's, that's a stage yet to come. Can I just ask, um, you meant you, uh, I think you said that uh, colorblind casting has problems in terms of um, it kind of reinforces stereotypes, is that? No, I, I, I was mentioning that a lot of people think colorblind casting is the, the great answer to, to the problem of representation. And, and of course, as actors, you want to be able to play any kind of role. You don't want to be limited, you know. You want to be able to play Macbeth, even if you're Malaysian or whatever. Um, you shouldn't be limited if you have the ability and the skill to bring something to that role. And so colorblind casting, I guess, um, uh, but it's not the, the answer and the be-all, and, and it's not enough that we are able to play roles out there. It, we need to have a variety of roles that also reflect our lived experience in our stories. Yeah, so that's a good question, Sean. Uh, I, I think uh, this issue of representation, you can't divorce it also from something which is socially situated practice in the sense that when you're performing a representation, you're performing to an audience. And I think that's where this kind of uh, cultural social dramaturgy comes in. It's a very important question, I feel, because it would be different performing Nadira in Singapore than to perform it in Malaysia. And in fact, I didn't want to bring it to Malaysia at all because I always had a sense that there's a much more conservative audience out there that's going to raise hell uh, if we bring that work there because it touches on certain things that... Um, you know, that, that they find unpalatable the idea that a Muslim woman can marry a, a non-Muslim man uh, under civil marriage. So civil marriage is something that's allowed in Singapore, but not in Malaysia at all. You cannot have civil marriage in Malaysia. So I thought, oh, you know, but so then it became about then how do we frame this work? Um, 
And so one of the things we, that we did was to have talkback sessions with sisters in Islam in Malaysia. Uh, that, I think, helped to facilitate uh, the appearance, emergence of this work in, in Malaysian society. And also, I suppose, um, the, the theatre audience is already somehow a more liberal audience in Malaysia. The space is important. We perform this at uh, Kuala Lumpur Performing Arts Centre. So even though uh, we had a Malay audience coming down, but already the space, you know that it's quite a liberal space. Uh, there have been lots of very liberal sort of works there. Uh, another thing was also, and this was something I realised much later, was that we were a Singaporean theatre company. So it was easy for them to engage with some of the ideas by sort of dismissing like, oh, they are Singaporeans, they're like, <laughs> you know, they're not really very good Muslims. They're like, they live in a secular state, so that's why they're capable of these kinds of ideas. So that, that some for some of them, it, it was their way of engaging yeah, with the work. So our reputation preceded us and I think gave us some degree of protection also. Yeah. And it was... Uh, Sort of in both languages, yeah, 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 yeah. So that that was also quite important. That some of these ideas. So it was a mix of both Malay and English, um, and we were aware that to do the whole play in Malay would be very transgressive. I think there's certain things that it's so difficult to to address in Malay. We don't even have a term for for homosexual, for example, uh, in in the Malay language. Uh, all the terms are slurs. So to be able to discuss homosexuality given that kind of a l linguistic um, background is very difficult. Yeah. If there's no word for it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to give a personal response um, to Nadira. Um, so actually, so I'm a Muslim convert. Um, I married a Malay boy, and um, Nad I actually went to watch Nadira at quite an interesting point in my life when I just got married, and obviously before that, you know, so sorry, indulge me a little bit. So before that, I went through the whole, oh, why can't we just get married because you love me? Why can't we have a civil marriage? Do you know, so we, I went through quite a bit of that. And then I met his family, and I realized his family are really kind, nice people. And prior to that, I watched the talaks and the thing. I'm like, oh my god, this society is crazy, you know, when I was in my early 20s. So... So there was a, obviously still a slight sense of fear, even though we live in Singapore. So anyway, I mean, I met his family and I realized his family was really kind. And that was really the thing that attracted me to the family and understanding why it was really important. So then again, so we got married. And then about a year and a half, when I was trying to figure out my, my position as a convert in the family and trying to navigate between my Chinese family and, and all that. And um, I actually went to watch Nadira on my own. It was one of those interesting things that I couldn't get my usual theatre kakis to go with me because they weren't really interested. For whatever reason, um, I couldn't get my husband to go because he wasn't really interested. Um, I think he, we were still at a point where he didn't want to get into a, a conversation about it. Um, and then I think actually Nadira affirmed, I felt it represented what could be me. Um, for me, a divorce was never... Uh, an issue of it's just if I have to I'll do it because I never believe that two people have to stay together you know and it was a very interesting conversation that that happened on stage that made me think about oh my god what if I have children in the end what's going to happen to my kid and you know all those questions but at the same time what really touched me and I remember up to this day was that at one of the scenes at the end um, I loved the way that it represented all the different voices in the show. And at this scene, there was a table, dining table scene between the mother and the daughter. And the daughter was really trying to convince the mom, like, why do you want to go through this civil marriage? Don't you love me? Don't you want to see me in heaven when we die? And she left the table. And the mother said to herself, why isn't the heaven the same? Why isn't it the same heaven that we will go to? And that really kind of affirmed in myself the idea that, you know, with religion and all the questions said about it, and, um, and I decided I can go on a journey to learn about Islam and kind of reconcile the family. So I realise now as everybody's talking, and then I was telling how Nian, this whole dramaturgy thing is all over my head, I don't get it. I just, but then I realised I think I'm dramaturging my life because I am constantly... <laughs> trying to navigate this relationship between the families. I'm trying to, you know, be the good daughter-in-law. I'm trying to constantly still be a good daughter to my mom so that she doesn't think I've lost her to the Malayus. And, uh, um, and in fact, next month, 
um, my husband and I are going to move in with my mom and my dad because um, they're getting on and we've decided that's what we had to do because we don't have children yet. And we asked my in-laws for their blessing. They were very happy. We we're very close as a fam it's two families. And they believe it's important. And then so we've gone th it's this whole big family project. My brother's paying for the house. My second brother's managing the renovation and we're moving in. <laughs> And then we had to you know, navigate the whole, okay, how do you renovate the kitchen? You need to have two different fridges because you have to have the Chinese fridge where all the pork will be and the alcohol. And we have to have an Islam fridge so that all the non... It's true. And then, you know, and then my mom was like, do you need two stove? And I'm like, no, la, stove is the same, but I need two pots, you know? So it was a very interesting Then we had to... It really went out, and I was thinking, oh my god, even the renovation. You know, my brother said, like, you need an extra oven. I'm like, yeah, because, you know. So, you know, it's, um, and I realized that is the multiplicity of this whole culture and whatever we're talking about. Even if I don't actively do that in my pra creative practice, oh my god, I'm doing this in my life anyway. So, sorry. So, it was just me indulging a little bit, and then suddenly it all coming together because I was telling Honey, I'm not gonna get this forum. I'm not gonna, I just. <laughs> But then, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm living it. I am living it, man, guys. So representation, all well and good, I tell you. So, yeah, so just a personal response. Um, uh, yeah, I'm Luan, by the way, and I do theatre for young audiences. So, yeah, but yes, thanks. And I love Nadira. It was really one of those shows that was really good. Good story, well told. Thank you. See, it's real. Yeah. I, and I think uh, that's where dramaturgy has this aspect whereby we, we also have to look at the receptivity in part of the dramaturgy. And a lot of time, dramaturgs are so involved in the making of it that, for example, we use the word social realism, but we're looking at the, how the world of the play is being constructed. But the social realism whereby the audience lives in may not be the same socialism as social realism or the realism that you create on stage. That mediation actually a lot of time has to be looked at and dealt with. And then you know, how do we actually mediate again? I keep using this word mediate because I think that's the work of the uh, dramaturg. How do they actually make sense of this language? And when it's being performed in, uh, in, in Malaysia, they live in a different world as what we perceive it would be. And of course, I think when we talk about color blinding, which is very interesting, uh, because Macbeth is no longer seen as that Scottish play. It becomes a metaphor, actually. It is a different realism. And so when we assess it with a social, with, with a color blind kind of a casting, we're looking at Macbeth from a different, with a different kind of lens. So I think uh, that's where the dramaturg play a lot of this kind of uh, conversation here. But I see someone holding the mic. Yes, please. Um, this is uh, a reflection and also. Um a comment on one of Edwin's works. Um, as I keep working in the participatory field of theatre, etc., I keep on being reminded that that type of work is a rehearsal for life, especially for the participants. Um, and uh, I think the more and more I think about that, a lot of the theatre that I'm starting to see, like more traditional theatre, is can be seen through that lens as well. Um, and then uh, this talking about representation and also the rough bits that Sean was talking about yesterday, Zero Feet Away, the work that Edwin uh, put on, uh, started off uh, jubilant, started off all of us expressing through our little text messages, you know, who we were interested in, the age we were, the, the, the sexual proclivities that we may have, <laughs> uh, that we may want to share publicly. And I just wanted to say that it was situated in, a, in an Adelaide nightclub, um, under, underground, and, uh, well not underground, but on a lower level. And uh, so we were sort of in a nightclub, but it wasn't a nightclub, it wasn't a nightclub setting, it was, it was starkly lit. And then at one point, the work turned and we were remembering the Orlando shooting. And that's where it became almost like a rehearsal for life. And, it, and it's really interesting what you're, again, going back to representation. We were there, 
we were sort of sharing and then we were in it and i'm and i there's these layers of representation that we that we're dealing with in in art and non art and i love the fact that you can get the rough bits as well that sort of you know sandpaper <laughs> these experiences it's just a comment thank you eddie as well <laughs> uh, just some word that very quickly i would just respond from there the word of transgression has actually keep coming in uh in 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 the way you say it also that's how when work become transgressive is it overly transgressive is it just confrontational to uh while there is rehearsal of life there's also rehearsal for change rehearsal for revolution uh so in that particular space as you are experiencing that thing is it a re a rehearsal or is it a a sort of a reminder of life and when does it then become a rehearsal uh when does it then become for change and for 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 revolution again i think that's another part of the dramaturgy that we probably would also have to look at and then within that space there is the private and the public the ethics behind it at which moment should certain things be, be coming in and when and where and how uh i think those are equally important issues especially we're transgressing between the real the authentic and of course we're looking to the future mm, and it sometimes involves the private and you know and your own person i mean he was talking about how to talk about sex life you know so how do you actually enter into the private world and yet be able then to 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 sort of put it into a platform such that we can we can share with it publicly but without actually feeling that your privacy uh is being infringed or being scrutinized yeah those are just questions any more responses Yes, I think we we have quite a very very uh fruitful session. I think even with, with more thoughts for us to carry into the afternoon, uh, where we will have uh, Charlene and uh, David having a conversation. Am I right? Yes. Uh, we'll come back at two thirty. Two thirty. We have a long time for lunch where we can again you know share and discuss. But thank you very much. Thanks for the sharing. Uh thank you ADN for this. Uh thank you and uh, I hope Luan you will have a good time flying back tonight thinking about your dramaturgy of life. Let's have lunch which is part the other part of our dramaturgy. <laughs>